Hello, and welcome to the nave. It is so great to have you with us today, wherever or whenever you're joining us, you are so welcome. Did you know that we have a weekly communion service? Every Wednesday at 10.30, we hold communion over Zoom. If that's something you're interested in and you'd like the Zoom codes for that, you can email us at office at stmikes.net or you can check out our news sheet for more details. Coming up in today's service, we're going to start with a time of sung worship as we bring our praise to God. Then we're going to be hearing from Hannah and Paul, and they're going to be talking about what they want to be when they grow up. Then Colin is going to be reading from the Word as we continue our year in the Book of Acts. And then we're going to be hearing from Kai as he talks about resistance to change. And then finally, we're going to be led into a time of prayer and worship by Alistair and Amy. But before we do any of that, let's get our heart right with God as we confess our sins to him. Lord, maker of heaven and earth, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words and in our actions. And we have left undone the things that we should have done. Maybe spend a moment now just bringing those things before God and laying them at the foot of the cross of Jesus. Lord, we are sorry and truly repent of our sins. Forgive us, Lord, by your mercy. Strengthen us and guide us by the power of your spirit to walk in this world as children of light. Amen. Let's worship.
Hi friends, welcome to our home. I wonder what you lot want to be when you grow up. What do you want to be when you grow up, Hannah? Well, when I was little, I wanted to be a nurse. Not sure why now, because um, I'm not very good with medical stuff. But now, I think that when I grow up, I'd perhaps like to own a tea shop and cook lots of nice food for people. Do you know what I want to be? Yes, actually I do, because you've been talking about it this week, Paul. <laughs> do you want to tell them what you'd like to be when you grow up? Yes, I want to film a travel series. Paul and Hannah go to Iceland. I think it would work, Hannah. You'd all watch, wouldn't you? Now, I think some of the people in our Bible reading can help us think about what we want to be when we grow up today. The Bereans in the Bible are described as having noble character. They were keen to get to know about God. I wonder which Jesus characteristic you'd like to grow up to have. I'd like to be able to forgive like Jesus. And me? I'd like to be better at listening to God. What about you? Dear God, you know how we'd like to grow up to be more like Jesus. Please help us to grow in those ways. Amen. Dear friends, today's reading is Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 15, as follows. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they put Jason and the others on bail and let them go. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, 
as did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Beria, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed on Beria, stayed at Beria even. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, lovely people. And it is so lovely to be with you all once again in the nave. And both the nave online and in the nave in this physical building. And as I stand underneath this roof structure, which reminds us of an upside down boat, I'm reminded of how the Lord keeps us safe on the journey of life. And as we sail the seas, sometimes rough, the Lord blesses us and keeps us safe. And this is a safe place now to gather in his name. And it's another reminder, if we even need it, that before we go any further, we need to pray. So Father God, we give thanks for your word. And we ask now that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to hear your word. Help us to listen to the things that you want us to hear and turn away from the things that you want us to forget. In the name of Jesus, your son, we pray. Amen. Do you know when an election is about to happen, or indeed we're in election season, how through your door seems to come a ton of leaflets? Leaflets from the different parties and candidates seeking to get your vote. Leaflet upon leaflet upon leaflet. Leaflets that you pick up and go, oh, how many trees had to suffer to produce these? Or, oh, have I got room in the recycling for even more of this? Or, oh, politicians, what are they like? You don't hear a word from them all year long. And then when you want your vote, they just bombard you with information. You know, those really annoying leaflets that you get. Well, I used to write those. Way before I was a vicar, one of my first jobs out of university was to write these election leaflets. And not just write them, but deliver them as well. And I've got to say, again, before we go any further, I'm sorry. I know just how annoying they were. But did you also know that they're not just random bits of information shoved through your door? And in fact, there's a real science behind it all. What leaflets are delivered to what parts of a community? What words are written on those leaflets? What pictures and graphics are used? The frequency of how many are delivered and where to? All of that, there is so much thought process that goes on. And even on the physical leaflet itself, so much analysis goes on with the words and everything else that are used. I had to learn that the hard way. As I say, when I first got that job, I wasn't long out of university. And when I was in university, people used to say to me, you know what, you are quite a good writer. You write a good essay. Thinking, brilliant, I've made it. I applied all of that knowledge to my first ever election leaflet. I showed it to my boss and he looked at it looked at me with some kind of disgust and basically said, you pompous little oik, what on earth is this? Go and do it again. Devastated, I said, what do you mean? What do you want me to do? To which he said, know your audience. And after that, he gave me a lesson. He got out loads of different newspapers, asked me to read them all, look at the sentence structures and actually see what most people read on a daily basis. And yes, it was very, very different to the things that I used to write in university. I had to change my whole writing style to adapt to this new form of media. But it also taught me this valuable lesson. And one of the most simple lessons that goes with any kind of communication, whether it's written, whether it's verbal, whether it's on the phone, whether it's by email or anything else for that matter, know your audience. Understand who exactly you are speaking to. Now, when we look at the Bible, 
Jesus was the master of this. He absolutely knew his audience inside and out. When we read through the gospel accounts, you see him speaking to farmers in a farming way. You speak, see him speaking to seafaring people in a seafaring kind of way. You see him speaking to the intellectuals in an intellectual kind of way. You see him speaking to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, in a very non-Jewish way. You see him speaking to the Pharisees in a very Pharisee type way, the Sadducees in a very Sadducee type way, the disciples in their way and beyond. Read through it and you see what an absolute genius at communication Jesus was. And it's no wonder his ministry was so effective as the Lord spoke through the Spirit upon him to do these things. He was God. Of course he could do it. But what about those who came after him? And especially in our reading today, Paul in Thessalonia because he himself also appears to be something of a master of communication. He understood his audience very well. He had traveled with his companions to Thessalonia, and there you had a mixture of very strong up intellectual Gentiles, prominent women who were really important to the organization of that Greek society, and you had Jews as well. Before this, Paul had spoken to a different group of people in a different way, but now he was using all those skills of intellect, all those skills of understanding the Jewish law, all the skills of reason to communicate with this group of people, and it worked. He really knew his audience. The Lord's Spirit was upon him, and so many people came to faith. And you know what? That key lesson of knowing your audience is so important to us today as well. One thing we speak a lot about in church is the need for evangelism, the need to proclaim the gospel, the need to communicate the gospel with a world that doesn't really know the gospel story. We know that we live in a society, in a nation, which by and large has forgotten the good news of Jesus, forgotten the gospel, and we know we need to do something about it. We know that somewhere around only 2% of people in this country go to church on a Sunday. We know that there is a huge need out there. And we know that we need people who will act as evangelists to tell their story, to tell the story of the gospel, to see people come to faith. Now, traditionally, we have adopted this particular method of telling people the gospel by getting special people to do these things. People with dog collars in churches, special evangelists, and holding special events to get people into church one way or another. And by and large, though we can't knock it, it's also fair to say that the success has been limited. Maybe we need to rethink what it is to tell the story of the gospel and to rethink what it is for us to know our audience. Maybe one of the biggest questions we need to ask ourselves is, who are our audience? Who are we speaking to? Who are we communicating the gospel to? Because that will differ for us from community to community, to church community to church community. It will differ from person to person. And you know what? Every single one of us has a role to play in it as well. It isn't just for the preacher. It isn't just for the super evangelist. It is for each and every one of us. We ourselves are called to tell the gospel story just as Jesus did and just like Paul did to this church and the people of Thessalonia to see people come to faith as well. And yes, we need to know our audience as well. Perhaps the big question is, how do we get to know this audience? How do we get to know the people who we want to talk to? How do we get to know the community or the groups of the community or whatever else that's going on? We do it by talking. We do it by listening. And we do it by valuing people around us. And we don't need to speak to large groups of people. 
Sometimes we just need to speak to one person, two people, a family of people, a friend, a work colleague, whatever. Understand them, understand their needs, understand their questions, and understand where they're at. Tell them our story. Tell them what the Lord has done for us. And just watch them and pray for them and seek that they themselves would come to know the story of the gospel. Did you know that something close to only 7% of people come to church because of people like me, vicars? The vast majority of people, 87 or so percent in fact, come to church because of a person who goes to church, someone who's befriended them, somebody who they've met, somebody who was in their community who they've had a conversation with. People come to church through people because people know people. We get to know the audience. And when we know the audience, we know how to tell the story of the gospel. Fundamentally, that is what happened in the book of Acts. They knew the audience and they spoke to the context of that audience. And we need to do it as well. And you know what? When we do it, the results can be absolutely amazing. More and more people can come to church. More and more people can have their salvation. More and more people can have the life-changing experience of coming to know the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. More and more people can be involved in the work of the Kingdom of God and they themselves can go and tell their audiences the message too. Keep telling the Gospel, sharing the Gospel, seeing the Gospel shared throughout communities and before we know it, we've got a revival on our hands. And isn't that a wonderful thing to look forward to? Yes is the answer, but also no as well. And I'll tell you for why because revivals are really messy things. When people come to faith, they bring their issues, and we've all got issues. When people come to faith, they tend to change things in church. They tend to change the order of how we do stuff. When people come in, they need to be loved and valued, as perhaps we love and value each other. And seeing more and more people come to faith will alter everything that we're about. It will alter the makeup of our churches. It will alter our friendship groups. It will alter our style of worship even. It will alter absolutely anything. And you know what? It sounds good on paper, but in practice, it can really suck. And it can make us think, well, what's the point? I used to be a somebody in this church, and now all of a sudden other people are coming in to want to do stuff. It can bring a change. And change isn't always a lovely thing. And certainly, in the context of this reading in Thessalonia, it wasn't a very nice thing at all. After Paul saw these Greeks, these Jews, these prominent women in the community come to faith, it disrupted that community. And it disrupted to such an extent that a group of people wanted to rise up and get rid of them. The safety of that community, the dynamic of that community, everything that people knew about that community was on the change. And for those who didn't like that change, it was a scary, scary thing. And so these troublemakers, great word, came up and decided to get rid of Paul and his companions and pull it all back. Get a bit of order back perhaps and see life how it always should have been. Get rid of this phase called Christianity once and for all. And you know what? I kind of understand where they were coming from because all change, even really good change, brings with it its own threat. And we need to be aware of that threat before we want to see the church grow. If we want to communicate the gospel in such a way that so many more people will come to faith, We've got to know that it will come at a price. We've got to know that it will come at a cost. And we've got to know that when it happens, it will bring change. You know what? Vickers for generations and generations and generations have talked about church change. 
We've talked about church change. We've talked about big plans. We've talked about doing this, that, and the other. We've talked about the need for change. And too often we look back and think, yeah, we've seen some change maybe, but not loads of change. Because change so often itself can feel slow and takes a lot of effort and other things come up. But here we are in a situation where we've been forced to change. COVID itself has brought a lot of change to the church. COVID has changed so many ways in which we meet together and worship. We've been forced to change in so many ways. It's crazy to think that a year and a half ago, doing a service online like this would have been less laughable. We would have been so focused on being in a church building on a Sunday that we never would have contemplated doing church in this way. But we were forced into that change and the gospel itself can be communicated more because of it. And we want to communicate the gospel more because of it. And you know what? Feel free to share this Facebook thing. Feel free to share this service on your social media or stick it on another YouTube thing, whatever. Share the gospel that way if you need to and the Lord makes you want to do it as well. This change that we are going through is inevitable and it is scary. People coming to faith is scary. The church in itself changing is scary people rise up against it and more than ever we need to know the heart of the true audience that we serve as Liz would say the audience of one the Lord our God in heaven we serve him and when we put our eyes on him all those other changes make sense all those other things make sense all those scary things make sense the vision of what he wants to do makes sense. The desire to value other people and see them as an audience to tell a gospel to makes sense as well. The desire to actually communicate and be open about our faith makes sense as well. There's one thing above all which Paul did and his companions did, and of course Jesus certainly did, and that was look to the Father in heaven. And from the Father in heaven, the insight came. The knowledge of the audience, the knowledge of the communication, the knowledge and the desire to speak and the ability to speak and tell as well came through the power of the Spirit. Now I've said this before, and you know what, it's worth saying again, I really believe that the Lord wants to move I believe that the Lord wants to move in Aberystwyth, where I physically am now, but I believe the Lord wants to move in the land of Wales as well. I believe that the Lord wants to move in the UK, in Western Europe, North America, and other parts of the world where the Christian message is struggling, where church attendances are falling. I believe that the Lord truly wants to move, but in order for him to move he needs us to be willing as well he needs us to be willing to get up and do what paul did and communicate the gospel he needs us to be willing to get out there and persuade people know the audience and tell them who jesus is he needs us to be willing to change to go along with what has happened at the time and he needs us to be able to resist those who get cross and angry when that change comes its way we need to focus on the Lord and we need to be directed by him. There are and there can be exciting times on the way, exciting and scary times. But when we're in the service of the Lord, it is all good. And I wanna pray now for us that we would be communicators of the gospel. I wanna pray that we would know the audience to whom we, and I mean we, each and every one of us, is speaking the gospel too. I wanna to pray against the fear of the natural change that will come when others come to faith as well. Father God, we give thanks for your word. And we give thanks for the example of Paul and how he spoke to the audience in Thessalonia. And Lord, we pray that we would know our audience as well and the people who you want us to speak the word of the gospel to. 
And I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit where we are. And where we are now, you would give us names, you would give us insight, you would give us knowledge of how to speak. You would give us the courage to speak as well and have the conversations that need to happen. I pray you would reveal to us now in our minds and throughout this day and in this week and in our dreams as well, the names that you were placed in our hearts to speak your gospel to. I pray that we would know our audience and who to speak to. And I pray, Lord, that through the communication of your gospel message, the church would grow. The kingdom of God will grow. More and more people will come to know the Lord. And whether that's in a physical church building or online, more and more people will come to know the name of the Lord. And I pray that would bring so much change. Change to the church, change to the kingdom, change to the community, and yes, Lord, change to the world. And I pray that we would not fear that change. And I pray that you would strengthen us to resist the fear of change and the want to fight against that change. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would wash over us all. Wash over us now and make it all good. Lord, come and bless us, we pray. And we ask that you would send us out in the power of your spirit to be your evangelists, to be your communicators in this world. Send us out, we pray. Amen.
another song within my soul my strength my hope my all and all is you Jesus you Change can be a really difficult thing. Whether we're trying to make it happen or whether it's happening around us and we just feel like we've got no control. And sometimes it's difficult to know whether change is a good thing. But that's why it's really important that we align our hearts with God and make ourselves flexible to his desire. And the best way to do that is spending time with him in prayer and worship. So let's do that now as Alistair and Amy lead us in a time of prayer. Let's just take some time to gather together to pray. Father God, we pray for the leaders of our countries as they make decisions following the COVID-19 pandemic for the UK and for Wales. We ask you to bring wisdom to the leaders of the UK government and the Welsh government about how and when to ease restrictions. As those people start to set and relax new rules and make decisions that affect us all, we ask that you bring them wisdom, that you bring them guidance, and that ultimately they seek you in all they do. As they make decisions that affect everyone, especially those who are most vulnerable in society, God, we just ask that you be at the centre. Amen. God, we pray for those who are in leadership positions across churches and communities um, as they navigate through COVID-19 uh, and they work their way through what they are and aren't allowed to do. I just ask that that won't be a barrier to them helping guide people to you, Father God. We thank you for new ministries, for the new things that have started uh, cropped up during the pandemic, Father God, for online church, for edge communities where people have just moved into new communities and, and just brought salt and light to those. For the evangelists who are just going out on the streets and telling people about you. Lord, we thank you for these opportunities, these new opportunities where people have been held back before now, but have taken the new way of doing things and have used it for your good, Father God. Mm. And we ask you to bless all those that lead these ministries, be it in church services, in church leadership, or within communities, Father God, or online. Amen. Mm. And Lord, as restrictions ease, we pray for protection over people's health. We ask that you guide our wonderful NHS staff as they support people and help people on a daily basis, not just with COVID-19, but with a whole host of other things, Father God. And we ask that you just bless them in the, the magnificent work they do. 
Father, we particularly pray for not just physical health, but for mental health. And we pray for the mental health crisis that's currently going on. We ask that you help to guide people to provide the right resource at the right time to the right people. But also that you bring comfort and peace to those who are struggling with their mental health at this time. And may we as Christians be there to support and help people through those difficult situations mm -hmm. and equip us to do that. Let's just take a, a minute, a time of reflection to bring to God all those who are in need of his touch today. For those who are sick, who are unwell, either physically or, or who are struggling with their mental health, let's just bring those people to God now. So Father, we ask that as we've all brought these people to you, that you will be there to heal and comfort them, to bring your Holy Spirit to guide them, and just to surround them with your love and your touch and your comfort today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just bring to you all those people who don't know you yet. Lord, I pray that you will help us as believers to be good ambassadors of your kingdom, that we may be equipped and faithful in directing them to you. Lord, there's so many lost people out there right now that don't know you. So Lord, we're just going to take a moment now just to bring all those people that we love and care for, maybe those people that we have come in into contact with over the last few weeks or last couple of days, those that are heavily on our mind. Let's just bring those people to God right now. Father God, I just pray for those that don't know you and for those people in our lives that, that need you. I pray that, Lord, you will just come by the power of your Holy Spirit and I pray that you will meet with them face to face, that they will know your, your love and your might and your faithfulness, that, Lord God, you will not be questionable that your Holy Spirit will just dwell within their lives, that their lives will be transformed for the glory of your name, Father. Amen. Amen. Lord, as we've prayed for the restrictions that are being lifted at the moment, Lord, we think about the travelling industry and all, all the people that are planning on their holidays now at the start of the, the summer holidays. Father God, we pray for travelling mercies, that, Lord, you would protect us, that you would guide us in wisdom, in knowing what the right thing to do is. The Father God, that you would be with all those people, Father, that may be in another country that's turned amber and they are, they are worried. Lord, we pray for all those people that are desperate to see family that's abroad, but are too scared and frightened to go. Lord, I pray you'll bring wisdom, the Father God, that you would just be amongst us. We ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And Lord, we also remind you of all the young people and children in our communities, in our lives, in our churches. Lord, six weeks is a long time for families that may be don't have very much. Lord, I think just think of all those young people, Father, that are in, in families that are not very secure. Those families, Lord, that are below the breadline, that are really struggling this year. The families, Lord, that are feeling guilty because they're not able to go away, that they haven't got the finances, Lord, to, to take them to activities locally. Lord God, I just pray for those families that, Lord, you would be with them, that, Lord, the guilt would be gone in Jesus' name, mm. that, Lord, you will help them realise that just spending time together is more important 
than any financial contribution they make. Father, just ask you protect the, the children and young people in families where there's, there's abuse. The Father God, that you would just surround them with your Holy Spirit. That you would protect them, protect their minds and their bodies. And that help will come to them that need it. So Lord, we just hand over this six weeks. And I pray that Father, as believers, as people that belong to the church and belong to you, Father, that you would open our eyes to those around us, that you would direct us to those that are most in need and help us to be the best example of Christ that we can be. Help us, Lord, to turn our eyes to you. Let's just take a moment now to ask the Lord to, to reveal to us those that are most in need and ask his direction in the way that we can most address, best address these situations. So Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that we've had where we can come and gather and, and, and speak to you. We thank you that we get this opportunity, Father God. And Lord, I pray that we will never, ever take it for granted. We hand all these prayers to you, Father. And for the week ahead, I pray you'll bless us and that our eyes will be turned to you. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, we ask. Amen. Amen. Consume me from me 
Yes, Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory because no other name is worthy of it. Lord, would you help us to worship you not only in song, but with our lives, whether we're at work or at home, wherever we find ourselves, Lord, would our lives be an offering of praise to your name and that our very breath would be a hallelujah to the King. Amen. We really hope today's service has blessed you in some way. And if anything has resonated with you and you'd like to speak to someone, um, you can do that. You can email us at office at stmikes.net and we'll get back in touch with you. Or you can call us during office hours on 01970 617 184. And we would love to speak to you. Equally, there is prayer available now straight after the service as it goes out live on a Sunday. Um, if you'd like prayer, just email office at stmikes.net and we'll send the Zoom codes out to you and we will be praying with you shortly. Equally, if you are listening to this later in the week and you'd still like prayer, email us at prayer at stmikes.net and our team will be praying for you. I really hope you have a fantastic week. But before you go, let me bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Mm -hmm.